Today is June 13th, 2011. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a volunteer with the History Center and with me is Tony Hilliard who is also a volunteer at the History Center. We're honored to have with us today Rusty Redding who is a Vietnam veteran and has agreed to come in and tell us his story in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Mr. Redding, we really appreciate you coming in. Uh, we're honored to have you, and we're looking forward to hearing the story of your your life and particularly your experiences in Vietnam. Would you give us your complete name and current address, please? Russell Frederick Redding, Jr. And where and when were you born? LaGrange, Georgia, September 15, 1942. And tell us a little bit about your upbringing. My dad was a textile engineer, grew up in the textile town in South Carolina, Spartanburg, it's the name of the city, small city. Uh, I had the advantage of city life and country life. We lived at the edge of town. We had a lake to fish in, a lot of woods to hunt and play in, so, and had the uh, opportunity to have guns at a young age. 14 years old, we were turned loose with shotguns with, with my pals. So I had a background in the woods and in fishing and hunting. Loved, learned to love the outdoors. Um, grew up in the 1950s watching a lot of World War II movies, a lot of John Wayne movies. A particular movie that probably influenced me a lot was a movie in 1954. Richard Widmark was the star. It was called Frogman. It was about the Navy underwater demolition teams in World War II, which had only been ended seven or eight years you know, before the movie was made. I had been a became a competitive swimmer after that, and and thought, well, that may be something I might want to do if I ever had to go in the military. And at the time, the military draft, everybody knew they had to go in the military at some point in time. And I thought, well, if my time comes to go, that, that might be a unit I consider. And the uh, irony is, I think when I applied to go to Navy OCS, I didn't ask to go to underwater demolition team. I asked to be a supply corps officer. I was told, well, if you sign up here, you, we can't put you in the supply corps, but when you get to Navy OCS, just tell them you want to change to be in the supply corps from the line officer. First thing they told us at Navy OCS was forget what your recruiter told us, you're going to be a line officer. <laughs> so that, there my choices were underwater demolition team, Navy flight, uh, which I was disqualified for that because of bad hearing, uh, or hard hat diving, and uh, or explosive ordnance displays where you learn to take bombs apart. I thought it'd be more fun to blow them up than take them apart. So, I volunteered for the underwater demolition team. I was the only one in, out of 500 officer candidates in my class who volunteered for the UT teams. Uh, so as far as the uh, uh, entry into the service, it was uh, OCS commissioning and I reported underwater demolition team training in uh, 1966 in Coronado, California. And to say it was physical, training would be an understatement. It was physical training on steroids. And one of the things that we began to notice, the fellow officers in the class, was that there were 70 of us in the class. And even though the training was really difficult, what they were looking for was spirit. They wanted you to define, in other words, spit in the instructor's eye, step on Superman's cape, uh, whatever they were doing to you, they wanted to see you asking for more. <laughs> and so what we would do, we learned what they wanted us to do, with, in a way harass the instructors back, but you had certain limits that you could go. But one of the ways you did that was make up little ditties or songs. You were always expected to sing a song in formation. You are never allowed to stand around. You are always singing or running, or both. And the uh, one way we would spit in 
Superman's Iris stand on his cape was to make Diddy songs, popular songs, insert words about the instructors, which gave them the right to, to, to give us more physical attention, you might say. Cold water, uh, standing in the surf, or uh, maybe get 50 more push-ups before they let you go eat after you'd already done about 200. So that was the way the instructors saw that you had some spirit and some spunk, and uh, and they could turn around and, and give you a little more of what they probably went through when they had training. In other words, they didn't want you coming out of that training class having suffered less than they did. That was our uh, training. Here's a photograph of they happened to give to me some photographers in the, in, in the underwater demolition teams who were, uh, went around and made some pictures of our training class. And this is me. This is called Rock Portage where you come in on a, a rubber boat, paddling on a rubber boat, and it, with the surf behind you, which can slam you into these rocks at a pretty hard pace, you're getting out of the boats and the water's over your head, and you gotta get this boat up on the rocks, over the rocks, as part of an evolution. And it's easy to get sideswiped and, and swamped in the surf, and of course, if you don't succeed, you get a lot of special attention. Is that you facing the? This is facing me. us. I think my face is about the only one. That's, that's okay. the reason they gave me this picture. Okay. Because I was the only one you could really discern in, in the photograph. Okay. Give us a little detail about the physical nature of that training. Well, they uh, to start off with, you had to qualify and do about ten pull-ups with your hands like this instead of bicep pull-ups, this, so many push-ups, so many pull-ups. And the training was uh, a lot of physical PT. He would put us in a circle and the instructor would get in the middle and you had to do what his, what he, what exercise he was doing uh, with, stay with the count with him. So you were doing an awful lot of flutter kicks because they emphasize that, lying on your back, because you're going to be using swim fins when you're in the water. Of course, it's ultimately a water-oriented activity. Lots of push-ups, lots of pull-ups, lots of rolling in the, in the sand. Uh, th these boats that we use, these rubber boats, weighed about 200 pounds. And everywhere you went, your crew of six, man and one officer would carry that boat on their heads. So you're getting a lot of neck exercise there, obviously. Yeah. And you're, uh, you're, you're paddling that boat, which is, if you can imagine, a large wet towel in the water, and it doesn't sink and it doesn't really float. It just sort of stays on the top of the water, not going anywhere, and then trying to paddle something like that. Well, that's what those boats were like. They weren't exactly streamlined. So you you think, well, paddling a boat, how, that sounds just like fun and a day in the park. But by the time you've done that for about 30 minutes, and you've got another two hours to go, and the boat's not streamlined, it sits down about four inches in the water, you are really working out your, your back muscles, your arm muscles. And uh, you, if you let up, you're letting your teammates down. So everybody's got to more or less pull their own weight, and if a guy doesn't pull his weight, the other guys get on him pretty well. And when, when the instructors sense that maybe a guy is not pulling his weight, they really get on him. Because you don't want that guy around with you in combat. And the guy's not willing to pull his load. So this is what a lot of the physical training does uh, that, that, that you, we determined is that weeds out the guys who don't want to pull their weight. Uh, in Hell Week, which is a week with about three hours sleep, uh, you're, you're working with telephone poles and six guys doing sit-ups with those and then pushing the poles over your head. So that's another point where it emphasizes uh, teamwork. If the guy's not doing his, his share, they're going to make life so miserable on him he's going to want to quit. He's going to want to take a warm shower and get dry clothes on. Uh, go to the mess hall and, and uh, call it quits. Approximately what percentage of your class did not make it? Our class was pretty typical. We finished with 
25 and started with 75. So that was, yeah. they say even today when the kids are a little more, in a little better shape than today's training, that the dropout rate still remains about the same. So it's, uh, dropout rates is fairly consistent. It's, you get people who drop out, good guys who maybe have physical problems, usually they're rolled back into another class. Then you got guys who say, well, this just did not worth it. I was a good athlete in high school, college, and everybody knows I was a good athlete. I'm not here to prove anything, so I'm, I've had enough of it. So they leave. Now, would this phase be considered SEAL training? Nowadays, this is called basic underwater demolition slash SEAL training, it's called BUDS, D-U-D-S, it's an acronym for that, and the dropout rate still remains uh, about the same. Uh, after training, uh, which is for us 20, 26 weeks, uh, well, let me go back to one quick thing in training that where the instructors encourage you to, to show some spirit and spunk, they like to give you a hard time uh, because, as I said before, they don't want anybody to come out of training with less harassment than they got. So, if they could catch you breaking the rule, they loved it because then they could lay on some more punishment. For example, we had a what we call an E and E. They called an escape and evasion trip down the Colorado River. This was the calm part of the river. It was not the, not the rapids. And you were in six-man boats, the rubber boats we showed you. And the rule was you were not to leave the edge of the river. And it was a five-night, all-week all operation. We started Sunday night and finished Saturday morning. And we were supposed to make so many miles down the river each day. And we knew that the instructors were there to ambush us and catch us and put us through waterboarding, which is been around a long time. What they did was instructors would put a bag over our heads and put us in water if we got captured, which we did numerous times. The bag would fill up and the water would slowly drain down. And if they especially liked you, they'd put a non-poisonous snake in that bag with you. <laughs> Waterboarding on steroids. Call it now. So you didn't want to get caught. So we laid our, our boat officer we laid back behind some of the other boats and let them get caught first. So, but as, as a result of that, we got too far behind to make our deadline Saturday morning past Lake Havasu in Arizona. So our, uh, this is an example of breaking the rules. <laughs> he uh, we beached our boat in the morning. We weren't supposed to go anywhere in the mornings. Uh, in the daytime, we were supposed to only paddle at night down the river to make our destination. Our boat uh, chief officer went downtown in Havasu, uh, bought beer for us, and found a guy who drove an ice cream truck, told him our dilemma, and said we were about 20 miles behind our schedule. Now, he looks like an escaped convict, keep in mind. He's got on dungarees, <laughs> dirty, hasn't shaved in four days, three days. So he finds a guy who drives an ice cream truck and, and says, look, if you could come pick us up, we'll deflate our rubber boat, put it in your, uh, in your truck, and we'll pay you 20 bucks if you take us down the river 20 miles, that way we can catch you up with everybody else. Now, if we, we did that, that successfully pulled it off, the instructors never knew it. But had we been caught, we'd have all been punished unmercifully for, for doing that. So, that's an example of what the, what the instructors they, they they wanted you to break the rules. We were in we were in training for unconventional warfare, which means you think outside the box. They they wanted creative people who weren't afraid to break the rules, weren't afraid of the consequences. Because in un, unconventional warfare, what all's fair in love and war, no really rules in 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 the theater we were in. So. I think that's, that's an example I remember well about uh, uh, breaking the rules and sometimes getting away with it. A friend of mine didn't get away with it. They harassed him for a long time. They had all day because he couldn't paddle anywhere that day. So he, they kept him occupied for, for quite a while. You know, sometimes you won, sometimes you lost. But they, they wanted to see you willing to pay the consequences of, of, of either way. Uh, so training was six months. 
Uh, then I went into underwater demolition team 12, which we immediately deployed to Subic Bay, Philippines, to do to do beach recons off the coast of Vietnam. That was a pretty uneventful, uneventful tour for me. I was a communications officer back in Subic Bay. Uh, that deployment was six months, as were all our deployments, six months, uh, as, because we were able to get temp TAD or TDY pay for that, temporary duty pay. Went back into the States, we were based in Coronado, California, and it was assigned to SEAL Team 1 from Underwater Demolition Team 12. Then there was more, a lot more land training, land tactics. We learned from the Marine Corps, we sent a lot of guys to Ranger School. Uh, in Fort Benning, and, and as a matter of fact, used their patrol order guide for giving briefings before combat operation. We gleaned that from, uh, from our guys who went through Ranger School. So we got the uh, SEAL team training. Uh, uh, after, by that time, was uh, about eight weeks of land warfare, small unit tactics, and a lot of weapons. A lot of different weapons trainings. We, we went from a 57 recoilless rifle to uh, mortars, both mortars, 81 millimeters, 60, 80 millimeters, 60 millimeter uh, mortars, machine guns, uh, small, small arms comprised most of that training for eight weeks. Then I was assigned to Echo Pursuit, uh, SEAL Team 1. These are four of my guys and one of our interpreter uh, that I was deployed with to uh, a base called Na Bay, which was a small Navy base uh, in Vietnam. And the tactics we used there were platoon size of 12 men, enlisted two officers, many times break up into a squad of one officer, six men. And the tactics were what we were asked to do uh, was interfere and make life as miserable as we could for the Viet Cong who operated in our area which was about a 500 square mile uh, mangrove swamp from the uh, coast of Vietnam uh, up the shipping channel to Saigon which was a ship, actually a shipping port uh, on the Saigon River which was able, they were able to resupply with weapons, heavy weapons because you and war supplies in Saigon because you could get a deep draft vessel from the coast all the way up into Saigon. The, the swamp, the mangrove swamp, was too muddy. You, you could not get a large number of troops, of uh, conventional troops, in that area because you were up to your waist in mud. It was tidal, which could go anywhere from, from six inches above uh, all the the high ground even, you could have no high ground wet that stayed dry. And at low tide you got mud so deep that, that you couldn't operate, for example, if you put an army company in there with two or three platoons and tried to maneuver them through, you'd get one group bogged down on the left, your right flank might be bogged down and your center area, center platoon might be able to advance. Uh, a little bit too far ahead of your flanks, so you could never use command and control with large uh, groups of uh, conventional military in this swamp. So, so the Navy, our Navy officers who were uh, SEAL team officers sent over there to say, well, what can you guys do here? So, well, we think we can operate in the swamp in small units of six to twelve men and ambush, uh, lay ambushes at night because the Viet Cong, our enemy then, called Viet Cong, were able to move at will through these swamps and the tributaries off the large rivers. High tide, you could go about anywhere in this swamp. Uh, it seemed that this would be an ideal operating area for the first first operating seals in Vietnam uh, were assigned this, this tactic to uh, go out and do ambushes that were mostly done at night. Uh, Sometimes we would insert, uh, give a typical day, a, a, a typical two or three days, and this is a cycle of the way we work, that the platoons operated in this area. You plan your operation with, with what we call the TOC, Tactical Operations Center, and they would, that's where we would always go to plan an op. They could tell you whether the Air Force was planning a B-52 strike, 
or whether the Army was going to put an artillery strike in here, whether there would be a conventional unit maybe out on the fringes. Uh, uh, you, you certainly didn't want to be looking up at the open bomb bays of the P-52. So, <laughs> could ruin your whole day and, and your platoons with you. So we coordinated, which planning an operation would take about four or five hours the time we coordinated with all the elements that might be in our area. And and we didn't want a, a stray uh, Army gunship, a helo gunship flying over and seeing us down there. We were in what was called a free fire zone, which meant anything that moved could be shot with no no legal consequences, no court martials, no, no no questions asked. But if you saw anything moving, you could shoot it. Well, sometimes we had to worry about uh, an army helicopter maybe flying over us a little bit off of his uh, normal route, and he saw movement down there and swooped down on us with his Gatling gun. So we were real careful to let everybody know. Um, all the all our, all the operational elements in that in the, in that area to know where we were and when we were going to be there. Uh, so that's four hours to plan an operation, and you got to give your briefing to your to your troops, which was about uh, take about an hour and a half, assign the weapons and what we were doing, what the mission was, and this was based on what I mentioned a minute ago, based on the Army <coughs> patrol order that. Uh, they taught in ranger school. All the elements, what happens if you get separated, who, what are your channels on your radio, uh, what are your coordinates if you want artillery, all the elements that go into a, to an operation. <coughs> then we would, uh, usually that would be late in the day, go to, go to bed and maybe have to get up about 2 o'clock in the morning the next morning because we had, a, had to get delivered into our insertion point, which sometimes could be as many as three to four hours away on the boats, Navy boats that would take us in. So you wanted to get into your insertion point uh, when it was still dark, early in the morning, twilight in the evening, so they didn't really see where you came, came in at the VC or anywhere in the area. So you get up two, three, so by the time you got in your insertion point, uh, which by the, by the way was your highest degree of fear, I think we, it, it, we uh, experienced in Vietnam was from the time you were 100 yards off your insertion point by boat to the time you got the boat into the, to the edge of the canal or the river, you always were puckered up, worried about were, were the VC there because that's when you're totally vulnerable, you're totally exposed, even though you might have on a flak jacket uh, and a helmet, when you're exposed in the, on an open body of water and your enemy is on the other side on the bank with machine guns, you're a pretty easy target. So fear, yeah, everybody's scared, everybody's puckered up when you insert. Once you get on the land and you haven't been fired upon and you set up your ambush or you, you set up your uh, uh, base in which you're going to depart on a patrol, you give a big expression of, okay, we're in, they didn't see us come in, nobody's shooting at us, they probably don't know we're here, so now we'll patrol, maybe we patrol a uh, click, a thousand meters, one way or the other to set up a ambush. So that uh, takes care of getting us inserted. Then our ambush position, we might patrol half a day to get where we're going to observe things, listen to things, listen for VC. Uh, maybe there's a base camp not too far away from, uh, that the enemy has where they're not, they don't know we're there, so they're making plenty of noise. Uh, that's happened to us on several occasions. So you, you move out on your patrol to your ambush point you set up for the night, so you're up all night uh, on your ambush point. Because uh, early in our involvement in Vietnam, the BC, our enemy, moved at will through this swamp because nobody had ever been in there after them, really, to any extent. So they felt pretty, pretty casual about their movement. So we had a lot of hits early on, 1965, 64, uh, excuse me, 65, 66. Uh, then they got wary about 67 about their movements and it was a little harder to, to uh, get a hit on an ambush. 
So an ambush, you're up all night. Maybe the next morning, they come in and get you out. So you've been up basically two days by now with very little sleep. You go back to the base, your weapons are totally covered with mud, slime from this swamp. Your fingers, you can't keep it off your fingers. You want to wipe your face, you just wipe the mud on it. Uh, a lot of us did use a mosquito net over our soft hats to keep the mosquitoes off your face at night. But you're basically covered with mud, your weapons are muddy. Uh, you can't stay out in that element very long and operate effectively because you're going to have guns jam and uh, you're, getting, you're getting extremely tired of fatigue. So we would go in, uh, clean up, eat, go to bed, get a nice sleep. The next day you start to cycle over the briefings that I mentioned, coordinating everything, four hours brief. Uh, so it was basically two days on and one day off as far as we were uh, operating in country. You know, the same cycle every day. Plan your operations, go out on your operations, uh, come back, clean up, start the whole thing over again. Now the area that we were operating in, that my platoon operated in, the Echo platoon, uh, this is a picture of uh, me on our base. There's a jeep in the background. There's a uh, some sandbags. A friend of mine, a Navy pilot, made this and sent this to me after the war. It was on a Super 8 film that he made. We, he cut, a, cut one of the frames out. Uh, later in the war, more platoons became involved in Vietnam and operated down in south of us in the Mekong Delta, which had a lot more population. Our area that our platoons for the first two years operated in was pretty much devoid of population. That's why it was a free fire zone. Then later, more platoons uh, from the East Coast SEAL Team, SEAL Team uh, 2, came and began to operate down in the Mekong Delta, which is the rice bowl, where all the food was grown from Vietnam, very fertile area, and you had a lot of population. They didn't do as many ambushes as we did. They were working more on prisoner snatches because uh, and the, 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 we would get information very much like is going on now with, in the war in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. You get a prisoner and he can tell you uh, when a Viet Cong cadre or infrastructure is coming into a village to indoctrinate uh, the villagers on the virtues of communism. Uh, the tax collectors, they could tell you when the tax collectors would maybe be on a river bank collecting uh, taxes from the Vietnamese farmers who were taking their produce to, uh, to market. They would be hailed over by a tax collector who would have uh, three or four security guards with him usually with weapons so that the farmers, the Vietnamese farmers didn't have much choice but to pull over to uh, where, the, where the VC is hailing him like this. This means come here in Vietnamese. We do this. They do this. Uh, they would be hailed over to the uh, tax collector, give up part of their produce or their money to the tax collector, uh, and if we could get information on when the tax collector was going to be in a certain place, a certain promontory point, maybe on a river, we could. Uh, load up a boat and fill it up with produce. This happened several times. Put a, put a canvas tarp over our guys and, and maybe one of our interpreters like this gentleman here. This, this was, the fellow was out of, the, our interpreter was out of the well, group we trained. This was a Vietnamese version of their SEAL team. We would often go out with them put them under a canvas and the tax collector would hail us over, well he'd be, get a big surprise when we got up close enough to the tax collector to throw the canvas off and open up on the tax collector and his bodyguards. That began to win us over with the people in, in down in the Delta. Uh, and by the time the, the uh, Tet Offense had hit, we had won a lot of uh, hearts and minds uh, over. We, we're pretty sure in the, in, in, in the Vietnam, in the South, Viet, South Vietnamese uh, Mekong Delta, because we had eliminated a lot of the, the infrastructure and uh, the tax collectors who were not real popular with the South okay. Vietnamese farmers. Uh, to go back to uh, 
the worst fear I, when I mentioned was going through our evolution of how one day, two day, three days went on an operation. The worst fear that we had, and, and I can honestly say I don't think anybody could admit they weren't scared when we did an insertion uh, on an ambush or a patrol. Our worst fear happened one night. Uh, my Navy craft, a patrol boat, with my platoon was inserting. We put the bow right onto the edge of the bank and I turned, I was standing on the machine gun mount behind uh, the coxswain of the boat and I leaned over to tell my guys behind me that we were going to go in off the front, off the bow of the boat, the front of the boat tonight because he, it was high and he could get us in high enough so maybe we not, might not have to jump in the water and could stay dry that night. That was a happy day. You could start an ambush at night and, and have dry clothes on. So it looked like it might be a dry ambush at night. Things were going real well. It was high tide and we thought, well, we can get the bow of the boat up in there close uh, through some of the bushes. We can jump off and stay dry. So I turned around and said, they're not gonna, we're not going off the stern, the back of the boat. We're going off the bow. About the time I got turned my head, lowered my head, the whole sky lit up with tracers, tracer bullets from the bank. And for about, and our other boat, the other platoon, the other squad that was backing me up was about 50 yards away on another boat. They were not as close to the beach in case something happened to us. And the sky lit up for about a click, about a thousand meters. They were, evidently this was a Viet Cong company that heard we were coming and had dug in and are in the bank and ready for us. My boat happened to be on the very right, their left flank, our right flank of that ambush. So we didn't draw as much fire, fortunately. Uh, that was a night I thought I was going home in a body bag. When I hit the deck, uh, I was waiting for a rocket to hit us because they had these shoulder-fired RPGs that they use now in Afghanistan. Uh, but our, our coxswain put the boat in reverse we backed out. Only one guy, my corpsman, fell off the bow, and uh, I didn't know if he was shot or uh, just get, getting in the safety of the river. And uh, so we pulled back uh, about 100 meters and realized that uh, my corpsman had gone off the side, off the front. He paddled underwater and got out about 50 meters. We went back in and got him. So we had 100% no casualty rate that night. Wow. So that was a, a worst fear scenario that came to pass and nobody was hurt. We didn't even get a scratch on any of our guys. So I consider myself very fortunate. Yeah. Uh, worst case realized. Uh, another example of worst case fear happened to me. Uh, we had an ambush, successful ambush, uh, in an area where uh, one of our platoons had been shot up real badly about three months earlier and taken two, two kills to KIAs. Uh, we ambushed five young Vietnamese men who were uh, out in a free fire zone after curfew. One of my men uh, drift, drifted too far down the river. He went over to inspect the, what was left at the sand band to see if there were any documents. In it. And uh, I was rear security, but I had a field of fire I could see down, the, down this river. And one of my own men had gone, had inspected the boat, and the current, I assume, had, drift, had made him drift about 150, about 50 meters away where he wasn't supposed to be, or I didn't, the plan was he wasn't supposed to be there. So I pulled, I thought, well, that's one of the VC who got away when they went over the edge when we opened up, they went in the water. And uh, he obviously escaped the initial burst of fire. And I said, he's getting away. He was swimming like a crazy man. Like he was really trying to leave the area. And I said, that's a VC. I pulled my weapon up on him. And I thought, now at night, you tend to shoot high. Aim down low for his head, which I did. <laughs> Thank the good Lord, I shot high. And uh, I was informed by the rest of the Tune. Hey, that's our guy. He's out of. He's down there. Don't, don't, wow. don't, uh, don't fire a second time. Well, I worry a lot. That gives me more cold chills 
when I think about it, than the time I was we were ambushed, as I just described. Yeah. Though there, in one case, I almost lost my life, in another case, I almost ruined my life. Wow. Uh -huh. yeah. So, very fortunate. Uh, I don't seem to have any problems. I think about that every now and then, and 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 you know, inwardly shiver and think how close that came yeah. to being a tragedy. And which points up the fact that in war things happen like that. And uh, if you can get through a war without hurting yourself or somebody else, you're just very fortunate. I think. Uh, uh, so that gives, I, when I have that thought, I think, well, there's, if anything happens to me the rest of my life, nothing could ever be that bad. So yeah. the experience of war, I think, gives you a different, certainly gives you a different perspective on your life and, and the slings and arrows that can come your way. So you yeah. Nothing could ever be that bad. So, no. in other words, I've dodged two of the biggest bullets a man can, yeah. can dodge, I think. So, I uh, consider myself very fortunate. Uh, tactics in Vietnam, let's see, maybe I can enlighten elaborate a little bit more. Uh, specific operations, uh, thought one of the things that stands out in my mind, we were asked to uh, try to capture one or two prisoners up around Cameron Bay, which is north of where we normally operated. This was, we were in brown muddy water in the swamp, and this was up the coast of Vietnam where they had white sand and pretty beaches and clear water, and we were asked to our platoon was asked to try to capture one or two people where they thought supplies were being unloaded uh, in an area off a very, in a very beautiful large bay. Uh, we thought the, the intelligence, intelligence community thought that this was an area where uh, we could capture someone. Supplies were being offloaded from the ocean, uh, received there on the beach, uh, and then taken inland to the to the economy. So we were tasked with going up there uh, and trying to capture somebody around a, a certain geographic location that they gave us. I was tasked to be a swimmer scout along with, we always worked in pairs, you always would have a swim buddy. And uh, the operation was, was like this, the uh, platoon was to lay off about a half, about 500 yards off the beach. Uh, I and my swimmer scout buddy were to go in and scout the area out before the platoon came in and give them a signal to come in when it was safe. And you always do rehearsals before you, if you had a chance, and, and make it as lifelike as possible before you had an operation. So we rehearsed from, from getting in the water, swimming in to the beach with swim fins. Uh, we wore inflatable life jackets, which we didn't inflate until you needed them, so they were pretty much fit your body profile had straps in the back and we would use the swim fins to swim in, take the swim fins once we got inland and stick them up behind your back so they weren't flopping and making noise hanging from your, from your web belt. Well, in doing this rehearsal and, and swimming in and, and acting as if we were scouting out this area, we noticed these fins were squeaking, squeak, squeak. There were rubber fins stuck up behind our, our uh, pipe jacket in our rear behind our backs. So we said, well, here's what let's do to eliminate that. Let's just swim in with one swim fin. <laughs> so we swam into the beach that night, uh, the operation night, with one swim fin. Uh, left the other one back home. And once we got ashore, we, were, we had to determine if there were booby traps. We knew it was an area that was probably pretty widely used. You know, they thought, the intelligence community thought there'd be a lot of activity there. And uh, so we thought it might, it might be booby trap. So our job was to feel along with our hands to see if we could feel trip wires or hear, see anything. So we would work about 10, relay 10 yards, 10 yards. He'd go 10 yards, I'd go 10 yards. Well, it was really a welcome, welcome sign when he, he would tap me and say, okay, it's my turn to go 10 yards. <laughs> then I got to get right behind him. If he trapped, tripped anything, it was, we'd pro probably both been hurt. But, Anyway, he would have been the tripper, not me. That was the, I can still remember the sense of relief when he, I'd feel a tap and he'd say, okay, it's my turn. Take the next 10 yards. 
So we were in that operation about three days and did capture two, two suspects and turn them over to the uh, Vietnamese. All the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese uh, Army did all of the uh, interrogation. Uh, we might have bystanders to stand by, but uh, we, we turned them over to them. Never heard any results on that, but that was an operation not particularly to remember. Maybe I could uh, say a few things. I think I might have cut off my uh, upbringing just a little bit, uh, people say, well, why, was ask two questions, why did you go on the SEAL team, why did you do that? Uh, the answer is, I didn't know about the SEAL team, it was a secret in 1966, uh, Navy wouldn't admit it, that it existed, it was only the UDT, only underwater demolition teams. Uh, and I think another explanation for that is growing up we saw a lot of World War II movies in my generation and uh, the movie I mentioned uh, and, and I remember vividly when I was about 12 or 13 years old the Hungarian revolution where the Hungarian people revolted against communism and were fighting in the streets with you know little small rifles small weapons against uh, tanks and their homemade Molotov cocktails and uh, we're giving the Russians a hard time, but ultimately, of course, the Russians won. And growing up, I think I had an attitude, uh, an understanding that communism was not really a great deal uh, for people. Uh, my dad was uh, self-employed, uh, had self-employed business. Uh, the uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the premier of Russia, in my formative years, told our president Nixon, and uh, that Russia uh, told him face to face with the news media there that Russia would bury us economically and militarily. So in my in my formative years, between the World War II movies uh, and college, a history professor, I remember, said every generation has a war to fight. Uh, I knew that uh, my dad had been a commissioned officer in uh, the 1930s. Uh, it seemed like it was just my time to go, but th that's how I internally answered the question, well, why did you do this? And I thought, well, this is it's just my time to serve. And uh, communism was, was, was the issue. Uh, we had a treaty called the CETO Treaty that we made with the Philippines, Australia, and Thailand and said, if any of you, any, any of you guys, any of you countries need help against communism, we'll be there to help. Well, thought that's what we had to do, yeah. honorable thing to do, which I think would explain my attitude uh, as far as serving, wanting to serve, willing to serve. Uh, well, you're you're the type of the individual this country needs to protect it. We appreciate right. what you did. Freedom's freedom's not free. Yeah. Say. That's right. I want to ask you <coughs> a few questions going back to your experience while you were in Vietnam. When you first landed and got off the plane in Vietnam, what was your first impression? Well, I can back it up. About 10 minutes before landing, we flew over in a, our unit, our platoon, flew over in a Navy four-engine propeller plane. We were very low over Saigon and looked down and the city lights were on and you could see motorcycles and at night with the lights and cars and I thought, well I thought there was a war going on over yeah. here. <laughs> I thought it would be blacked out. What is what is all, all this activity down here? And I uh, learned that Saigon tried to operate as if you, you go in the city of Saigon, the capital, and they more or less acted, it seemed like. They acted like, well, there's no danger. What, what me worry? <laughs> Is the enemy at the, or the barbarians at the gate? Yeah. And, and I, I think, I think it went through my mind. Well, if, why are we here? When I see these young guys driving motorcycles around, uh, why aren't they in uniform? Uh, was the question I yeah. asked so pretty soon after we landed. Yeah. Uh, did you have the opportunity to deal with the Vietnamese civilians at all when you weren't out in the field? 
Not a lot, no. I, I, I was not a, uh, an aid worker. Or, uh, we, we did see a lot. We had a, a town, a little village right outside of our base, and there was a lot of interaction. You did your laundry there, and uh, they seemed to be glad to have us, seemed to be glad that we were there. Uh, patronized the, the restaurants uh, right outside the gate of our base. Uh, I've since learned from a Navy pilot who went back to that base some five years ago that half, half the city was VC. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be sure. Welcome. Oh, no, excuse me. You go, you go ahead. I want to be sure we've got the identification of your teams, your units. All right. Uh, and w would you give those to us? Uh, you, you mentioned them as you were talking, but I want to be sure we specifically have the names. Well, my uh, first unit was, uh, of course, what's now known as BUDS, Basic Under Dem Demolition uh, SEAL Training, which back then was called Underwater Demolition Team Training, UDT Training. I was in class 37, uh, started in January of 1966. Uh, the next assignment was Underwater Demolition Team 12, which no longer exist. The underwater demolition teams were combined with SEAL teams some 10, 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, I was underwater demolition team 12. The next unit was SEAL team 1, which was 1967 to 1969, when I was released from active duty. I had three and a half years, uh, you might say, in the teams uh, all together. From the time you went into Vietnam to the time you left, were you able to see any significant difference in either the attitude of the local people, of the Vietnamese military, or just the situation in general that you observed? I can't really say that because my, my second tour was in 1968 and I was assigned to the uh, 9th Division, the Army's 9th Division and the Navy's Mobile River Marine Force down in the Mekong Delta and I was pretty much isolated because I was on, a, on the staff and I was on a ship out in the Mekong Delta so I didn't really interact with, yeah. with, the, with the people. But from what we, we felt like, the, the Mekong Delta, which was the rice bowl and where all the population was, was pretty much getting pacified. The, uh, the last big thrust that, that was made between my tours, I left in December, Tet Offensive, which is very well known and mm -hmm. mischaracterized to a great extent, mm -hmm. was right after I left my first tour, and that was January. Oh, six, January of 68? 68, yeah. yeah. I went back in June of 68. That pretty much decimated the Viet Cong in the Delta. All of their good operators, so to speak, their sappers and their uh, their fighters were pretty much killed, and and as as it was all over the country. So the Tet Offensive, but by, by the time I left, and then you had the Tet Offensive, which decimated the VC, the VC ranks, their infrastructure. By night, summer of '68. You can pretty much drive a motorcycle anywhere in the Mekong Delta. And the Army, the Vietnamese Army, was beginning to, to, to the way we felt at the time, was beginning to, to do better. Their officer corps was, was, was taking more guys from the ranks, bringing them up, rather than just the privileged ranks, privileged uh, class that had been in their officer class. So I think the feeling was the Army, Vietnamese Army, was beginning to fight better. And the Mekong Delta was pretty getting secured. And the, and the, the Tet Offensive really hurt to be at Cong. Yeah. Uh, in that sense, I, I think, in the, and my active duty didn't end in 69, so that was the feeling we were getting back in the States, yeah. back where we were home, home base. When did you, you had six months between tours. Tell us a little bit about that, where you were and what kind of reaction you had from either civilians or others that you dealt with who had not been to Vietnam and 
during that six months? Well, it was our tours were six months, but I never had six months between them. Uh, we weren't able to have because of the demands that we had. Once the Navy figured out, or we told the Navy how we could work, and once the Navy realized we were getting results, they wanted us there all the time. So the demands for our presence uh, kept increasing. So we had guys from did five tours, six months each, but uh, in some cases uh, back to back. Uh, uh, I had four, I had a total of five tours and never had more than two months between each oh, tour. Okay. So, and I was in a, in a military town. I was in Coronado, which is across the bay from San Diego, okay. which is a very military conservative town. Yeah. So I was not getting any of the... Okay. Guff that a lot of guys Good. got coming back, flying Good. into San Francisco or Good. going back into the Northeast, uh, wear a uniform around all day in San Diego, yeah. <laughs> and that no problem. Now, when you would go back for one of your tours, were you essentially with the same members of the team that you'd been with before? No. Well, a platoon would pretty much break up when it came back to the states. Uh, some some of the enlisted guys might have asked for a certain school to go to. Uh, they'd go off to the school. Uh, maybe one of the more experienced couple of guys might have said, "Well, I'm willing to go back, make make extra money, and okay. get promoted." You know, you enlisted guys could get promoted faster in Vietnam. Uh, so when a platoon would come back, it would pretty much break break up as an entity. Uh, that was, platoon was 12 enlisted, two officers, uh, and new platoons would be forming to go, uh, but very seldom did were two platoons going back to back or stay intact and go, and, and go on another trip. So would that mean that you would constantly be learning to work with new team members every time yeah, you go that's back? Yeah, right. okay. that's right. But you had the advantage of, you knew the crucible that everybody had been through. Yeah. Uh, everybody had to go through the same training. So, okay. you know, I knew at least you had that bond in, yeah. in common. And it's being a small community like it was, and our enlisted guys pretty much stayed in Coronado their whole careers. Okay. So you would have an E6 or so, he would, he would know all about the, the young E2s. Yeah. Coming in. Okay. No, they're rep everybody has a rep has a reputation in the teams that you can't escape. <laughs> yeah. It's such a small yeah. community. Yeah. So, yeah, you would you would train with a new platoon. For example, if I had come back and, and been assigned a platoon, I would have begun that. I described the the micro cycle that we went through three day three day or three four days. The macro cycle would be you'd come back and you'd get another platoon. You start training in the desert. You'd have three or four new guys, total new guys out of training. You blend them in with some guys who had a tour. We go. We uh, would go in the desert in California where we could fire uh, weapons and mortars and uh, do the, start the training cycle all over again. Yeah. So actively, the platoons operated in Vietnam from about 1966 to about 69 when Vietnamization started okay. where we were turning everything over to the Vietnamese and our platoons began about, by about 71 pretty much quit operating except pulling out pilots, down pilots, yeah. uh, the, the movie Bat 21 about the army colonel shot down, he was pulled out by a SEAL, uh, Tom Norris had got Medal of Honor. Uh, when did you... Very few of those guys left They were doing that. Around. Yeah. That's time. When did you return from your last tour of duty in Vietnam? Uh, September 1969. Okay. Uh, and when did you exit the Navy? Uh, let me clear that up. I, I, September 68 was 68. my last. Uh, okay. When I returned to Vietnam. Then I had. Uh, Shore duty for until uh, January '69. I went to Taiwan, uh, Taipei, for a joint operation with the Chinese. Uh, 
the nationalist Chinese. And Tell us about that. That was an operation, uh, a joint operation with all the branches, the Navy, Army, Air Force, uh, our, our branches, and all of the counterparts for the nationalist Chinese. And uh, it was a scenario, if you read between the lines, which was to say, we're going to help you take the mainland back, which we didn't really believe at the time. Yeah. But it was, it was all set up. Chiang Kai-shek was still alive, the nationalist leader of Chinese. China at that time, come from mainland, been run out of the mainland over to the island of what was foremost in now, Taiwan. Yeah. And the operation was set up to say, we're behind you, we're supporting you, uh, and this is how, if you want to go back to mainland, to mainland China and take it over, this is how we do it. <laughs> of course, it never happened, and I don't think diplomatically we were ready to do it, but it was something to let the Chinese, nationalist Chinese, know on Taiwan that we were backing them. Okay. Very, it was a very interesting tour. We were, uh, all of our offices, our work offices for that exercise, which was about four months, were in a Japanese tunnel built in World War II on the island of uh, Taiwan, which went back hundreds of feet into this uh, mountain. And you had a main tunnel, and then you had smaller tunnels off tributaries huh. off to the side where you set up office desks. So interesting. Very interesting, interesting tour. Wow. Japanese had that place very well fortified, and they say it's historians say it's a real good thing we didn't try to take Taiwan instead of Okinawa. Really? Huh. Did you? Discharged from the service when you returned from Vietnam the last time? No, I uh, I was I stayed in as a training officer with SEAL Team One from September to January of uh, '69. I was training officer, which meant I sent sent our guys off to different schools, Ranger schools, uh, uh, diving schools, hard hat schools. Uh, what is hard hat school? You mentioned that. Hard hat, that, that's your old conventional divers that have the hard helmet okay. over here and okay. weighted boots and okay. a little porthole out here. I got you. See, okay. that was, uh, they were used for, for repair, underwater repair, welders. Okay. Uh, when you had a dry docks or a ship, or a ship that could be repaired, maybe with a diving uh, element instead of having to put it in a dry dock yeah. to get to it accessible with the hard hat divers. So when did you leave the, the military? Uh, I did the operation in Taiwan that I just described in uh, spring of 69, got out in July of 69. Okay. So I was in a total of three and a half years uh, assigned to the teams and uh, half a year at OCS, Navy OCS, a total of four years. Give us an idea of what you've done subsequent to your discharge from the Navy. Well, when I got out of the Navy, uh, I realized that I was 27 years old and I better find a job. <laughs> so I uh, began to look at an interview and I accepted a job with a company that made graduation supplies for colleges and high schools. This would be diplomas, caps and gowns class rings, yearbooks, everything related to a graduation uh, ceremony or a, uh, graduation event and uh, called on colleges and some high schools and have done that since 1970, 71. Wow. Still actively in that business. Yeah. I have two children, uh, two sons, Eagle Scouts, they're both medical doctors here practice uh, medicine here in Atlanta. Very proud of them. Well, I know they're proud of you too. <laughs> I told them, uh, they said one time, I want to be a SEAL. I said, no, be a doctor first. <laughs> then you can be a Navy SEAL after that. <laughs> but don't quit med school. <laughs> well, you've got a fascinating story. And I, I want to ask Tony first if you have any questions. For no. And I also want to give you an opportunity to, to 
say anything else you want to say before we... Well, let me take a quick check here. Yeah. yeah. See if there's anything I think I, think I missed. Um, probably what are we doing on our time? We're fine. I'm going to turn this off while you're looking through your notes. Cause, or at least... I'd like to go back and make a, a quick comment about the uh, operation I mentioned when we were uh, on a inserted and we were ambushed at point blank range. Uh, I think this was looking back on it and what I realize now, and I, I say this because I think it's pertinent for today's military and what's happening in Afghanistan. Uh, General Westmoreland, who was the commander of all the forces in Vietnam, had a policy that every operation that was conducted had to be uh, vetted and uh, and had to be, you had to advise your counterpart, the Vietnamese counterpart. We were called guests in Vietnam, not not an army, not an occupation army, but we were a guest. So under the heading of being a guest and to comply with what the definition of a guest, we had to uh, advise them on every operation that took place. Uh, and, and after reading things now post Vietnam War, I'm pretty sure this is what happened the night we were ambushed. There was a tactical operations center, which is where every, all that was the nerve center, everything was coordinated through this tactical, tactical operations center. That was your Air Force, your Navy, all the different branches that might be operating in an area so you didn't have your own people friendly shot up. Well, I think this rule uh, is what resulted in, in the fact that the enemy, the Viet Cong, that were right there where we inserted that night. In the tactical operations center, you, all, you had a Vietnamese counterpart, and they were told, all operations were put up on a board when they were going to happen. Uh, of course, it didn't allow Vietnamese civilians in there. You had the Vietnamese military. Well, knowing what we know and pretty much since at the time, every Vietnamese in the army had a had a cousin who was in the enemy on the enemy side. It's just the way it was. And they weren't as Vietnamese weren't as concerned about security as we were. And they tended to get on the radios and, and talk and divulge probably more than they should. So I suspect that that night that, that we were ambushed, and they had to know where we were coming in. The area was a 500 square mile area. I mean, it, for them to pinpoint a place where our boat went in just seemed highly improbable to me. And I think it's a result of our operation was planned and discussed in the Tactical Operations Center, and I think. Vietnamese counterparts just got on the radio and told maybe didn't with no maybe no uh, intent to bring us harm, but nevertheless, facts were that yeah. he might have been a little bit uh, loose with his talk on the radio yeah. Yeah. about hey there's an operation going in here this night. I can't tell you within you know, 10 meters of where it's going to be, but maybe if you're spread out, you know, they may be somewhere within this thousand yeah. meter click, yeah. uh, a click, which is a thousand meters. They may be somewhere in this land, somewhere in this area, and if you're in this area, then the, our enemy probably interpreted, well, if we set up on that area, we might catch them, yeah. catch them point blank. Um, so I say this now because with our recent SEAL team, recent success in Afghanistan, with the Bin Laden episode, I think that worked because we didn't tell anybody. We didn't tell a, yeah. uh, we didn't tell our counterpart on the Pakistani intelligence side what we were going to do. Uh, kept it totally close to the vest, and it worked. Mm -hmm. Just imagine three helicopters 70 miles inside in, uh, foreign territory. How easy it would have been to. Yeah. to shoot these helicopters down that, that uh, killed Bin Laden, yeah. carried the troops that killed Bin Laden. So yeah. I think that was a, a policy that was erroneous and our, our leadership in Vietnam shouldn't have adopted if it was a super, super secret operation and it involved uh, uh, 
life and death, I don't think uh, you, you need to tell your, your counterparts who could be suspect yeah. as far as their ideology and their leanings go. Because uh, the Vietnamese people, they didn't know how long we were going to be in Vietnam. They didn't know if we were going to pull out. They had to play part, part both ends, both sides, both teams. They, did, they didn't know which team was going to win. So if you yeah. throw a few crumbs to this team and a few yeah. crumbs to the other team, maybe they could maybe they could retain their life standard, which you yeah. can't really blame them for. Because yeah. we were having war protests. This was 1967. They were, could read our mail. They read the newspapers. They knew that there was a lot of unrest in this country over, over the Vietnam War. And they might have figured, well, we're just going to you know, play it close either yeah. way. We don't yeah. know which way this war is going to go or we, which side we ought to be on. So, there, so as a result, we'll just be on each side a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Do you get together with uh, members of your team? Oh, absolutely. We have a big reunion, team-wide reunion. I think we got a, I got a chance. Five no, I got a chance. Oh, Jim. Oh, cool. Okay. Oh, oh, you know what I mean. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, SEAL Team uh, reunion is every year, uh, third weekend in August. Uh, we put it on our calendars. Uh, I try to go about every other year. It's in Coronado, California. It's from everybody from World War II to current. Uh, we have some World War II guys show up, up to the current uh, current era. And it's really good to see everybody. And we get a briefing on what's going on now within the teams, uh, as much as they can tell us. No press is allowed, so we don't and the outsiders there. It's very interesting. I'm looking forward to going in yeah. August of this year, but, uh, 2011. Before we finish, I want to give you a chance to say anything you'd like to say to people who may see this DVD in the near future or people who see it down through the years. Just anything at all about your experience, your life, or anything in general. Well, the, is this would this be a question on how I think Vietnam ended, or I don't want to get political? It can be just anything you want to say. Anything. Well, I read something real interesting recently, and it said we had five presidents. We had Eisenhower, who wrote a long letter to Churchill about something neat back in the fifties that we were a little worried about communist expansion. We had John Kennedy, who said no way we were going to let them go communist. We had Lyndon Johnson, who obviously fought the war in Vietnam. We had Richard Nixon, who uh, bombed North Vietnam, uh, but due to popular uh, concern in this country, began to pull us out of Vietnam, but he didn't pull all support out. So uh, then you had those presidents who were all, in a way, supportive of Vietnam, but then you had a Congress in 1960, 1975, who cut all funds, total funds, off the support, even the support of the Vietnamese, even though we had no troops. We could have supported with naval gunfire. Uh, we could have supported uh, <clears throat> from the air with no troops on the ground and kept Viet South Vietnam a free country, which is what we were there for 10 years, 12, 15 years to do. So we had five presidents who thought this was a good fight, and we had one Congress in 1975, we totally sent South Vietnam yeah. into the communist state. With, uh, and I, I think it's pretty pretty much a shame that yeah. it had to happen that way. I feel like all of us who served in Vietnam in a way were betrayed uh, by that congressional action. Yeah. Well, and particularly in light of that, we want to thank you for your service in Vietnam and for what you did, for your bravery. Uh, you were in the obviously in the line of fire quite often based on what you told us and uh, you showed a lot of courage and determination both in Vietnam and in your life and we're honored that you came to the History Center today to tell us your story. And well, I'm happy to do it and uh, appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your service to our country. Thank you.